All right, good evening again, church. Let me encourage you to uh, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. And I want to read Matthew 24, verses 36, all the way through Matthew 25, verse 13. I know that's a very lengthy portion of Scripture, but I think it's necessary that we kind of see the the big picture of where we're going tonight uh, before we get into the text. So let me read that to you, and then we'll turn to the Lord in prayer. Matthew chapter 24, uh, verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there will be two men in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the Lord or the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household? to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, My master is not coming for a long time, and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour which he does not know. And will cut him in pieces and sign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in flask along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast. And the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we just uh, thank you for the opportunity that we have uh, to just gather spiritually Uh, through the blood of your Son who has made us one with you, Father. We thank you for the opportunity to pray. We thank you for the opportunity to sing. And now we thank you for the opportunity to gather under your word. Father, I pray that your Spirit would do so much work here. Things are so difficult, especially for me as a speaker or a teacher of the word of God. I pray that your Spirit would fill me and give me the words that I need now. Give me the ability to speak clearly and boldly and faithfully the Word of God. And give us all ears to hear and hearts to understand. Lives that believe and repent and humble ourselves to the Word of God. And Father, let us walk in a way that pleases and honors you. Lord, we praise you and we love you and we thank you for the privilege of worship that we have this evening. In Christ's name, amen. Now, it's a little unusual for me to um, get so topical with the text, but I couldn't help it this week. I spent a great deal of time around some other folks, especially those from different, uh, I guess you'd say, denominations and the such, talking about the end times. It seems as though with all the chaos that's going on, there's so much talk right now about all the end time things. And it's funny how people 
often associate tragedy and suffering and difficult times with the return of Christ. And the global pandemic has certainly stirred the pot of almost everyone, uh, even those who don't go to church or don't go to church very often. Everyone's talking about these things. But things like we're experiencing now are not associated necessarily with the immediate return of Christ. Several passages in Scripture that re, that talk about the day of the Lord or the coming day of the Lord. In fact, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, I believe, that the, the coming of the day of the Lord is more associated with godlessness and, and wickedness. But it's funny how people don't necessarily think about that, but rather they think about odd things happening. Talking about this virus, I was reading about World War I. That was between the years of, of let's see, 1914 and 1918. In the war alone, 20 million people died. But in 1918, at the conclusion of the war, 50 million people died of the yellow fever that took place during that time. So with a world population of 1.8 million, you had about 70 million people die, roughly. Now, I can't imagine there being a more difficult time, and I can't imagine people not talking about the return of Christ in the midst of all that. But we'll see in, in a couple of places that not necessarily difficult things don't point to the return of Christ. Here's a passage for us that, let's see if I can get to pull up uh, real quickly here. Matthew chapter 24. He says, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Now I do realize that this statement here, this passage here, takes place in the context of the Olivet Discourse that we'll talk about in just a second. But nonetheless, even that, people still look at tragedy or or difficult times like we're experiencing now, and they immediately associate that with the return of Christ. But things like that's going on right now have happened before, and all of these things, in fact, that Jesus talks about here in this discourse, all of those things have happened before. There has been extremely difficult times, not just in the history of man, but in the history of the church, and we are faced with one of those times now. But again, that does not necessarily mean that the return of Christ is upon us at this time. So tonight I want to look at some of those things. But first, let me lay out the context for you of what's taking place here in Matthew chapter 24. Turn back with me to uh, 24 verses 1 through 4 so we can understand the context of the passage. Matthew 24, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up, to the point, came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Now, there's a lot of interesting things here. Number one, he's speaking privately with his disciples. And that encourages us because we see the grace of God preparing his people for what's about to take place. And we draw encouragement that God's faithful throughout all of Scripture to prepare his people. And that's exactly what he's doing here. But the disciples ask really two questions. They want to know why Jesus talks about the temple being torn down and destroyed. They're curious about that. But they immediately associate that with the end times. Now, this took place. The temple actually was destroyed and the stones were torn down and, and the city was burned during 70 A.D. Now, herein lies the problem. They ask two questions and they get really two answers in chapter 24 and 25. So the difficulty begins when you try to figure out when does he stop talking about 70 A.D. and when does he start talking about his return. Not only that, there's so many theologies out there about the end times, eschatology and these sort of things, even regarding the things that were particularly fulfilled in chapter 24 
And the discussion is whether or not 70 AD foreshadowed things that were to come. Not going to get into all that. It's fascinating to me that Jesus' answer begins with, see to it that no one misleads you. And there's so many possibilities that people argue about who profess themselves to be Christians. So many different theologies. I have no interest in getting inside anyone's camp and arguing theology with them about eschatology. That's not why we're here tonight. But I do want us to understand one of the most important things that are going on in this passage, and that is the imminent return of Christ. In fact, that is the condition that the Lord needs to find His people when He does return. And those are the particular things that I want to focus on tonight. And those are the things that we primarily find in the last half of chapter 24 and the first half of chapter 25. But obviously, the most important question to any of us is when? When will He return? And I don't think the Lord could have been any more clear about when He is going to return. And I've had these passages for you, but you can look down at your text if you want to. Matthew 24, 36, he says, But of that day and that hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. In 24, 42, he says, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. In verse 44, he says, For this reason you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think He will. And then 25.13, be on the alert, for you do not know the day nor the hour. In fact, if you'll notice in your text, 24.42 is a very similar phrase, therefore be on the alert, for you do not know, with 25.13, be on the alert then, for you do not know. And in between these two passages lie two parables that point to the reality that the Lord will return very unexpectedly. It will happen at a time where no one is seeing Him come, when no one is understanding, for no one is expecting His return. It is meant to catch us off guard with very clear reason. So we'll walk through those parables tonight. But the point is that we don't know when the Lord will return. John Brodus commented on this thought and he said, We know not when He will come. We need not know. We cannot know. And we should not wish to know. Yet, in spite of all that, what do so many Christians dive into trying to understand? The return of Christ. They get out the book of Daniel and they get out a few other passages and they get out their biblical calculator and they use the scale in 2 Peter 3 for a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day and they try to calculate the time of the return of Christ. It's completely contrary to what the Lord is trying to teach us. I think Jesus is probably pretty adept at biblical calculations. And I think if you could calculate the return of the Lord or the last day, He could have clearly done that. But He says He does not know. And therefore, don't spend a lot of time with people who want to spend a lot of time trying to figure out when the Lord will come. There is a reason that we do not know. And it works very effectively if you think about it for just a second. For believers, the understanding that we do not know leaves us with one thought. We always need to be ready. There's never a time when we should not be ready for the return of Christ. For the unbeliever, it works absolutely perfectly because they care not when He will return. Therefore, when He does come, they will not know, they will not expect it, and they will be filled with fear. And we will look at a few of those passages. So when will the Lord come? Have no idea. And we need to be perfectly comfortable with that as the church. Now, he is clear about many other things as well. The second question is, what will it be like when he comes? And I think the Lord faithfully answers that question as well. Look with me in Matthew 24, verse 42. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming... He would have been on the alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into. The Lord compares his return to the action or the efforts of a thief. Now, no one is able to predict when a thief would break into their house. That's the point. If you could predict when someone was going to break into your house, they would never break into your house. 
because you would be very prepared for what they were about to do. So the Lord compares himself to a thief because that's the point. You never know when that's going to happen, and so you always need to be ready for such things to happen. Now, almost all the New Testament writers grabbed a hold of this thought about the thief, and they worked it into their writings or their books when they wrote to us the New Testament. Look what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 2. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. He took those passages from what our Lord says in the gospel and he applied that to his own understanding about the return of the Lord. Peter does it in 2 Peter 3 where we'll be next week. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. John as well in Revelation 3.3 he says will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. So everyone understood very clearly that the return of the Lord was not known and it would be comparable to a thief breaking into your house, which is very good reasons for that that we'll talk about later as well. But he doesn't leave believers completely unaware. Look what he says again in 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul writes this, if I can get there. Here we go. Now, as the times and the epochs are epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. In other words, as concerning all these times, you you have no need of anyone to write anything to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with a child, and they will not escape. But notice verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. So even though the Lord comes like a thief in the night, we do not have to be concerned about that as believers because we are prepared for the imminent return of Christ. But unbelievers, it is going to be very difficult for them As unbelievers, they will be overtaken with fear while the believer is overwhelmed with joy. When you think about this, I was trying to think of an analogy for you to talk about being overtaken with fear. Oftentimes, or really the only time that I could think of when we're overtaken with fear is when things happen very unexpectedly. I was talking to Rob just the other day, I think the last Sunday, in fact, that we were together, about a time when Abby was very small. And I was standing at the end of the hallway, and I could see all the way into her bedroom, and she was climbing up a dresser. She had pulled out the bottom drawer, and she stood in the bottom drawer, and she began to climb up the dresser to get a toy on the top of the dresser. I was trying to stop this, but in just a moment, The dresser toppled over, Abby fell back, and the dresser fell what I thought on top of her, and all the drawers came out and slammed on the ground. I told Rob I was completely overtaken with fear, so bad I couldn't even walk through the house without stumbling. My legs had grown so weak. And when I tried to pick up the dresser, my arms were trembling. I was so afraid that my child had lost her life. Well, the bed had caught the dresser, and the only thing that she got hit with were the drawers. So she was banged up, but she was not hurt badly. Nonetheless, I understood that things happen so quickly, and there's nothing we can do about them, and they overwhelm us or overtake us in fear. Thus, the Lord's return is unknown to us in order that it may have that effect on unbelievers. There will be no time to repent and turn to the Lord. There will be nothing left to do but to watch the calamity unfold before their eyes and they will be filled with terror when they understand that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. He is Lord, He is King, and He is returned to judge. And at that that moment, their legs will collapse beneath them and they will fall down in great fear. Yet the believer will lift their arms and their voices in great joy for they will be delivered in that great day to them. So the fact that we don't know points to the grace of God and what He is doing. What will be going on when He returns? Well, He talked about this as well in that same passage, if you'll notice with me. 
Now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night while they are saying, Peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them. Now I know we could argue about the application of that passage, but if you take it very literally about the return of Christ, it's not the dangerous times and the discouraging times and the difficult times that we find ourselves in that point to the imminent return of Christ. It's a time of peace and safety and security to elevate the unawareness of the unbeliever when the, when the Lord returns. It's a time when all will be well. It's a time when after a virus takes place, has taken place and everyone has gone back to work and the kids have gone back to school and people are having babies and people are getting married and all seems well. In those moments when everyone rests and secure, the Lord returns. I think he points to that passage as well in Matthew before us today. Notice what he says in Matthew 24, 36. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, you find yourselves in difficult times. Again, it points to the grace of God. It is these times, these very odd and peculiar times, when so many people are losing their life from something we cannot see, like I prayed, that cause people to think about death. And when they think about death, they think about judgment. And perhaps the grace of God shines forth the most when we go through tremendous difficulties. Because it's the only time that people are willing to talk about the Lord. It's the only time when people face the reality of death. And really, it's often the time that people hear the gospel for the first time. So we rejoice in difficult days as we preach the gospel, praying all the way that the Spirit of God has turned on the heart of the unbelievers so that they can hear the gospel for the first time, repent and be saved. Listen, when there's peace, when there's security... When there's happiness, no one's listening. There is no reason for them to listen. And it seems to be in the scripture that that's exactly the time that the Lord will return. Now, last question, and it is the most important question, and I hope my slides are of some benefit to you. But how should the believer be found? Well, if you'll notice with me back in chapter 24, verse 42... He's very clear about this as well. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Chapter 25, verse 13. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. And you begin to toss with, well, what is exactly does alert mean? Well, I think... If you struggle with that, certainly you can clean it up in verse 44 when he restates himself and he says, For this reason, you also must be ready. In other words, the, the return of Christ could happen in any moment. And the only way to prepare for that to take place is to always be in a state of readiness, to be on the alert. So what we have here in these passages is we have the two bookends, if you will, and then we have two parables in between that help us understand what exactly it means to be alert. Now what follows is that is one parable and one description. The parable is about the judgment where we see the parable of the talents and hopefully we'll have time tonight to roll through that as well very briefly. But the parable of the talents help us understand the judgment. What immediately follows that parable is no parable at all, but it's a very clear description of the Lord describing what judgment will be like. And He even gives for us a clear description of someone who feeds Him and clothes Him versus someone who ignores Him. So we have the return of the Lord that stands in the context of judgment and all of that is surrounded by the idea for the believer to be ready and for the unbeliever to repent. I don't care where your theology lines up in 24 and 25 or the Olivet Discourse. You need to understand the bigger picture points to the fact that Christ will return, Christ will judge, 
And the only thing that you must do right now is to be ready for that return. And certainly I do want to talk about what it means to be ready. But that being said, let us look at the first parable that takes place again in verses 42 through 51. It was a parable about a master leaving and leaving his charge to two slaves of a household. And they were responsible to feed or to care for those around them. If you'll notice in verse 45, Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master puts in charge of his household to give them their food at their proper time? So he left two slaves with the responsibility of serving others. Notice notice verse 46, Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. So the master returns and he finds his faithful slave continuing in the things of God continuing in what the Father had told him, or what the Lord, rather, had told him to do. So that's the first one. And I'll point out in both of these parables, not much room or not much real estate or not many passages are given to the faithful because the text is warning the unfaithful and they get far more room in both parables. If you'll notice with me in verse 48... But if that evil slave says in his heart, My master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day, notice, when he does not expect him, at an hour which he does not know, and notice the judgment, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, the point of the parable is very simple. Be ready. You really don't want to go beyond that, and I'll show that to you in the next parable as well. But nonetheless, we have two men here. We have a faithful slave and we have an unfaithful slave. It's interesting in the text that both slaves are not only familiar with their master, but understood the instruction of their master. One was found faithful in doing, and other was found unfaithful unfaithful and not doing what the Lord had instructed him or left for him to do. And he was judged and condemned. In the next parable, likewise, we find two, if you will, groups. This time we have ten virgins, five who are faithful and five who are unfaithful. If you'll notice back in the the passage that I just read in verse 48, he was referred to as an evil slave. Those who are not ready in the parable of the virgins are referred to as the foolish ones. So we're beginning to see a pattern form within the parable. They're evil, they're foolish, and when we get over into the talents, they're wicked and lazy. Those are the people who are unprepared. But look with me at the parable of the ten virgins, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five were foolish, five were not. They were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in their flask along with their lamp. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and they began to sleep. Notice the unexpected return. But at midnight, while they were sleeping, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. In other words, there was no more time left. Then all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. Now notice the judgment on the ones who were not ready. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. But he answered, Notice, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. And then he concludes with the point of the parable. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. So we're left with the understanding that there were two groups here. One were prepared for the return of the Lord, and one group was unprepared for the return of the Lord. And the whole parable points to the reality that we need to be ready for the return of the Lord. Now, here's what you don't want to do with a parable that so many people are led to do. They want to do something with the oil. They want to do something with the lamps. They want to do something with these individuals being virgins. They want to do something with the number that five were saved and 
five were unsaved and communicate to us that half of the people in the world will be saved and half will not be saved. They want to do something fancy with the number 10. None of that means absolutely anything to the Lord, to us, and it should not be used in any way to teach anybody anything about the Bible. The passage, what it points to, comes at the conclusion of the parable. Be on the alert. And that's the point of the entire parable. And that's the only thing that we look to. Nonetheless, patterns are beginning to form. In both of these, we see the unprepared judged before God. And both of the unprepared are absolutely surprised at the judgment of the Lord. But the prepared, who only get a few passages again, go in to enjoy the presence of the Lord because they are adequately, sufficiently prepared to receive Him when He arrives. Now what follows, and I'm going to have to leave my notes here for you because I don't know exactly at what point I ended. I guess we can pick up there. Here again, just to point out, we have the masters and the slaves. He comes unexpectedly. We have the good servant being busy in serving Christ by benefiting others. We have the bad servant unkind to others and engrossed with self-gratification. The ten virgins, again, he comes unexpectedly at midnight while they were sleeping. The five ready ones had enough oil in their lamps and were ready when he came and were invited into the banquet. And yet the five foolish ones were unprepared when the bridegroom came and they were left outside. The next parable begins to turn toward the judgment. And I'll have to spend a little more time reading in this parable because we have not gone over it yet. But again, I don't want you to miss the flow of the text because the flow of the text is so important, especially for you if you do not believe in Christ. Because with the return of the Lord, there will be no time for you. When could He return? At any time. We don't know. That's the point. But immediately upon the return of Christ, always in the text, we have the judgment of Christ. And so we move from the parables about being alert and being prepared to the parables about the judgment because that is the flow that will take place. The parable of the talents goes like this in verse 14 of chapter 25. For it's just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received five went and traded with them and gained five more. The same manner, the one who had received the two gained two more. But he who had received one talent went away, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the masters of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five came up and brought five more, saying, Master, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. And his master replied, Well done. Good and faithful slave, you are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more. And his master said to them, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and I went away and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have back what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. He's being sarcastic. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and upon my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does shall be taken away. And then he says, throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what we have here is the parable of the talents. Again, he comes unexpectedly. Two are ready and busy about the service of the Lord and likewise rewarded. 
but there is one who is lazy. It appears that he understands the master. He appears that he understands the purpose of the talent. It appears that he understands what he was supposed to be doing. But he was wicked. He was lazy. He, was, he ignored his responsibility and he was judged by God. Immediately upon the conclusion of that parable, we begin to understand that in the judgment we will be clearly divided. Notice with me verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them one from another. Look with me in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then verse 41, Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and the angels. So we move from a parable into a clear revelation of what it will be like in the judgment day when we will be divided as a people. The faithful will enter into the glory of the Lord. They will enter into the joy of the Lord. And the unfaithful will enter into eternal destruction. Now, you immediately want to understand, well, what does it mean to be on His right? What does it mean to be on His left? What, did make, what made the determination between these two people? Well, if you look back in verses 34, he begins to explain the determination in the text. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you are blessed to my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something uh, to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. Sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. So he associates those who have been faithful, who have continued in the things of the Lord, and those individuals are received by the Lord into eternal joy. Likewise, what made the distinction between those on His left? Look at verse 41. Then you'll say to those on His left, Depart from Me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave Me nothing. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked? When do we see you sick or in prison or did not take care of you? And then you will answer them and say, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And then these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So this is what we're left with as we talk about, again, everything that we've looked at tonight. The day of the Lord will be totally unexpected. That's much of the point of the sermon or rather the Olivet Discourse. The Lord will come in a day that we do not know or we do not understand. Some will be lost, some will save. Some will be saved. The lost all have something in common. They are unprepared. And the saved all have something in common. They are prepared. So we go back to our question then, how are the saved prepared? What does it mean to be alert? What does it mean uh, to be ready for the return of the Lord. Now, this is where we have to be careful. Because when we ask that question, what does it mean to be prepared? How are the saved prepared? We have a tendency to abandon the Scripture and run to our own personal theology, what we think that means. I would like to point out that nowhere in these passages does it say that He divides the right by those who have been baptized and the left by those who have not been baptized. Or he doesn't say, come to me all you have prayed the sinner's prayer and be received into eternal joy. And all who have not prayed the sinner's prayer off to eternal condemnation or wrath. None of that is said in the text. So here's why we have to be careful. And I was trying to think of an analogy for you. If scripture was a bowl full of pearls, 
The only necklace that would be fit for a Christian is the one necklace that contains all the pearls. What we want to do if we look at Scripture as pearls is pick out those few precious pearls that mean something to us and string together a necklace and wear that as our own personal theology about what it means to be prepared for the return of the Lord. You can't do that. That's not a fitting necklace for a follower of Christ. His necklace contains all the pearls. And so we have to consider many other things about what it means to be prepared. Because if you look at these passages from the parables, all of these individuals continue in the faith. All of them continue steadfast in the instruction of the Lord. And if you looked at all these parables and and thought about the slave who continued to give them their food at their proper time, if you thought about the five good virgins who had enough oil to wait on the bridegroom, if you thought about the talents of the individuals who had five and had two and did well and gained more, if you looked at the judgment of God and understood that those who fed and those who clothed and those who visited and and those who cared for him while he was in prison versus those who do not, you could easily come to the conclusion that it's good works that brings about our salvation. But if you rest upon good works, you don't understand the gospel. But at the same time, if you exclude good works, you don't understand the gospel. We have to have a necklace that contains all the pearls. In fact, just thinking about saying we're saved because we're good, and I'll get into that next week when I talk about all the harmful, false doctrines that are taught even in our own area. When you think about good works, you need to understand he died because you're not good. And this idea that we go to funerals and people talk about they did good things, therefore the presence of God is in them is foolishness. If you're saved by good works, the rich young ruler is saved. He doesn't walk away disappointed. He did a great many good things. If you want to talk about the salvation by good works, then two men went up into the temple to pray and both men went home justified. If you think a Pharisee didn't do good works, you don't understand what the Pharisees were all about. It may have been strictly external, but it's not just about the good works. In fact, what is it in 1 Corinthians 13? If you give everything that you have away to the poor, right? And you have not love, you have nothing. So you can't sum up the gospel as you trying to be a good person. There's much more to it, but it's not excluded from that. How are people saved? Here is an observation from many of the places that we've been as a church together, and one of them, in fact, is a place that we will go. Genuine conversion causes a person to continue in Christ. There's no way that you can look at the parable of the slave, the parable of the virgin, the parable of the talents, and the judgment itself, and not come to the conclusion that genuine converts continue in the things of Christ. There's no way to draw any other conclusion. But we find in Scripture that they actually, to be in Christ, references or points to three realities. Number one, they continue in the confession of Christ. Jordan's carried us through 1 John before, and you can't come away from 1 John without understanding that a true believer always continues in the confession of Christ. In fact, if you want to go through the book of Hebrews, like we've done that as well, those who were turning away from their confession were being lost. They were not truly converted. So the true believer continues in their confession of Christ. 1 John, Hebrews, there's a number of places. But also, a genuine conversion continues in Christ by continuing in the character of Christ. This is the issue of holiness. Being alert, being ready means maintaining the confession. But being alert, being ready also means maintaining the character of Christ. Can we do that always? Absolutely not. Who did that always? Christ did. And His righteousness was imputed to us. And we were filled with His Spirit. Therefore, we can walk about in the character of Christ. Next week, we'll go to 1 Peter. He writes about end times, but rather than pointing to what we're about to talk about, the compassion of Christ, he points to the character of Christ. And he teaches us in the context of the return of the Son of Man, he teaches in that context that we ought to continue in the character of Christ. 
Can you continue in the character of Christ without being saved? Absolutely not. Because his character was from the issue of the heart. And it overflowed and we saw it on the outside. Likewise, the, the genuine convert continues in the character of Christ because his heart's been changed. He's been born again. He has a new character. He has new desires. Sadly, so many of us are around people that profess faith, but there's such a gross sense of immorality in their life, either in their language or their lifestyle or their sexuality. So many people profess Christ, yet look nothing like the character of Christ. Well, First Peter will absolutely, Second Peter will absolutely deny that thought as well as much of the other scriptures, 1 John included. Being a truly converted Christian means that you continue in the character of Christ. Lastly, how are the saved prepared? They continue in the compassion of Christ. We're walking through the Gospel of Luke now, and like we said, the first convert was a paralytic. Christ was so compassionate for the poor, for the hurting, for the hungry, for the lost, for the sinner. He came to save sinners. He says very clearly, it's impossible, absolutely impossible, to be converted by the Spirit of God and not think passionately and compassionately about the needs of others. That without is clear, without question, that is clear in Matthew 24, 25. This Olivet Discourse. In fact, the parable itself about the wicked, evil slave Notice verse 48 of chapter 24. But if the evil slave says in his heart, My master is not coming, and he begins to beat his fellow slave, eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and an hour he does not know, and he'll cut him into pieces. And he'll put him in a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The compassion of Christ can't be excluded from your conversion. But that compassion is not what saves you. It is the all-sufficient work of Christ on Calvary's cross when He died for you because you are wicked, because you are lazy, because you are not prepared. And He died to prepare a people for Himself. And He converts the inner part of that man. And that man continues in the things of Christ. He continues in His confession. He continues in the character. And He continues in the compassion of Christ. That is a better picture of all the pearls of Scripture when it points to those who stand before God and who are received. That obviously leaves all of us with a lot of concern and a cause to evaluate the conditions of our hearts. This is not a time to be selfish. This time that we're walking through right now is no time to be selfish and self-centered. It's no time to curl up and just protect yourself. You have to be, ought to be, must be deeply, deeply concerned for the needs of others. We have been converted and we are entirely different people. Now, I talked to a friend this afternoon and he gave me a wonderful passage that spoke to each of these realities. And it's Titus 2.11. The Word of God says, For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness. Here is the character of Christ. And worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously and godly in the present age. This is the character of Christ. Notice, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. Here's our confession. This is why we look to the skies because our blessed hope will return and we will not be caught unaware, but rather we will be caught prepared by the grace of God. And then lastly, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify himself, notice, a people for his own possession that are zealous for good deeds. There's your compassion. We have the confession, we have the character, and we have the compassion to do good things. And all of that is a result of our conversion. Let me say that again. All of this 
is a result of genuine conversion. That begs the last question of this evening. Are you prepared? I'm afraid that we live in a culture where most, most are not prepared. It's interesting when you look at the virus that's going around these days. Alabama is considered to be number four on the list of deaths per capita. They're experiencing us. They're saying that we are going to experience rather tremendous numbers in death over the next two weeks. I really don't think it'll be any different in the judgment. Even though we live what is considered to be the Bible Belt, I think the deaths per capita will overwhelm us when we get into the glory of God. Because there are so many people who thought they were prepared, who thought they had enough oil, who thought it would be okay to be lazy and wicked, who thought it would be okay to be selfish, who thought it would be okay to live their lives without concern or compassion for their fellow man. And they will be assigned to a place of wickedness. And there will only be a few who have been genuinely converted by the grace of God. I beg you, repent, turn from your sins, and call out to God for His mercy and His grace, and do so until He converts you. There's no magic way. There's no simple prescribed thing to do. It's not like Jordan was preaching in worship. It's not prescribed for us. A man must be born again by the Spirit of God. A man must be changed. And he is gloriously changed by the power of God and by the Spirit of God. And that man holds all of these things in his heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together this evening. Thank you for uh, these beautiful passages. And Father, thank you for the reality that Jesus is coming again. And thank you for the reality that we have no clue when that will be. That causes an immediate stir in our hearts for the unbeliever. It should cause overwhelming sorrow and overwhelming fear, knowing that they are unprepared. Father, I pray that you'd be so gracious to them. I pray that they would see Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as the Savior of mankind, as He who died on the cross for their sins, Father, and was buried and was raised for their justification. And I pray, Father, that they would repent and call out to Him in faith. And I pray that you would save them, Father. But for the believer, Father, I pray that we would examine our lives. Conversion brought a real change, and it changed in so many ways. It did not just change the words in our mouth to make some external confession, but it changed a heart. It gave us a new heart, and we have a confession from the heart. We have a character motivated by the heart. And we have a compassion that moves forward that is selfless in learning to be so more and more every day. So, Father, I pray that you would convict us all and help us all to turn to you in repentance and faith. All this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.